And he said in great frustration, he said, you can't be an advocate and a mediator at the same time. Good day, everybody. This is another episode of the podcast Walk Talk Listen. And actually, this is an episode of a new special series about um, the joint learning initiative from faith and local communities. This is a podcast called Walk Talk Listen. An attempt to connect people and make this world a bit better by sharing opinions and experiences based on the belief that everyone's perspective is true, albeit partial. My name is Maurice Blum, and I would like to welcome you to yet another episode of Walk, Talk, Listen. Good day, everybody. This is another episode of the podcast Walk Talk Listen. And actually, this is an episode of a new special series about um, the joint learning initiative from faith and local communities. And what we're going to try in every episode, we sit down with a unique voice, uh, individuals from varied backgrounds like non-governmental organizations, academic institutions, and JLI itself. And, you know, we would... We are trying to uh, delve deep into personal narratives and expert insights about the significant role of JLI at the crossroads of faith and development. I'm really um, delighted with today's guest, who know much, who knows much more about JLI than I do, um, has been involved for many, many years. Um, yeah, we'll ask her to introduce uh, herself to us, uh, Catherine. I'm Catherine Marshall. Uh, I'm uh, lead and very similar organization in many ways, the World Faiths Development Dialogue. I'm also a professor at Georgetown University. And all this comes after a very long career at the World Bank, where I worked on operational issues for development. And the last years, trying to build bridges between the worlds of development and religion at the at the initiative of the World Bank's then president, Jim Wolfenson. So I have about 25 years almost of focusing on the the bridge issues and much longer uh focusing on uh, international development more broadly yeah and and in in terms of the bridge uh issues um what are some of the challenges you you're facing with that particular work well my particular story highlights them i think uh jim wolfenson was a very well-respected, um, I would say loved uh, uh, president, but with, um, I think he had many supporters who saw mm-hmm. him as a creative, dynamic leader and also some some doubters. And when he and the then Archbishop of Canterbury started this initiative, which was really a first, uh, mm-hmm. at least at that level of visibility, of really trying to purposefully engage uh, the world of religion, it came as a great shock to him and to Mm. many others, including myself, when almost all of the member countries of the World Bank opposed the initiative. Uh, And so we spent um, a long time and to some extent continue to this day trying both to understand why people are so uneasy about religion. And secondly, uh, what one can do about it, how much of it is misunderstandings, how much of it is is well-formed views, etc. So to some extent, I have a lot of experience in trying to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and if you, uh, Catherine, if you compare it to, you know, your generation and the younger generation, is it going easier, you know, that translating, talking about religion, or is it more difficult or is it similar? Um, Well, one of the features of this particular bridging challenge uh, is that it seems to go up and down. Um, There is a major marker. Um, In fact, um, the uh, Jim Wolfenson, George Carey initiative started before 9-11. So it was not as much colored by the security issues uh, as is the situation now and 
there was much less visibility um, because the sort of the crude storyline is that for a long time religion was entirely invisible mm. uh, in the development world. That's not entirely true. Anyone who worked on the subcontinent, for example, uh, and on many other parts of the world was at least aware and and engaged uh, on issues of religion. Um, so it it wasn't completely that. But what you've seen since is is a growing interest in the complex issues, um, but also very much an association with individuals, um, leaders. And so when a leader changes, and this happened at the World Bank, all of a sudden, something that is an interest and has has some kind of um, of association changes, and mm-hmm. you've seen this with a number of governments. Uh, you've seen uh, the UK government is a good example, but so is Norway and the Netherlands and Switzerland. Uh, you can see, and Canada, you can see this happening in a number of countries, mm-hmm. as well as institutions. So, so um, even though there is broadly. I think a, an increasing understanding that the world is, as <laughs> sociologist Peter Berger used to say, ferociously religious in many ways, uh, that you still have, um, have some unease that has historic roots, that has political roots, etc. Mm-hmm. Where does your interest come from you know, in this topic? Well, my interest it comes mostly from my experience of engaging with the topic. Um, mm. I was, as I put it, drafted by Jim Wolfenson. Mm. He was somebody you didn't say no to, and I was a bit between things. The expectation was that I would do it very briefly, um, basically to set things up. But then uh, because of the challenges, I got drawn deeper and deeper into it and found myself increasingly fascinated by this world of different religious traditions, different approaches. Um, I'm very much interested in the in the ethical challenges that come out both of the dialogue, but also out of the religious traditions uh, and the way that they raise a whole new set of questions and issues around the development effort. In other words, what kinds of societies are we trying to build? How does it relate to human rights? Um, how does it relate to conflict? How does it relate to social cohesion? Um, and so I've been drawn into a field I knew not only a little bit about uh, in, in ways that I had never expected. What a, what a journey, because, I mean, you're now absolutely considered as one of the experts in this, in this field. So, so uh, that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, Catherine, um, this is, you know, this particular series is my, you know, a journey, my, me trying to figure out what is JL about, JLI about, why is it important? So I talk with a number of people about this organization. Um, do you still remember the first time that you heard about JLI? How, how did that happen? I was I was very much involved in some mm-hmm. of the very early discussions. Yeah, um, I would almost call them musings, um, mm-hmm. exchanges, um, some of which reflected very different currents and very different mm-hmm. objectives. Uh, in a sense, the core issue, which remains an issue today, but in a very different way turns around um, evidence. In other words, there was a hypothesis um, in the very early days when the discussions were taking place that the real problem was that nobody really knew what religious institutions were doing um, and that there was a need for more evidence. Some of that, just as an example, was that there are some very dedicated organizations that um, that it, uh, almost take the attitude, look, we're too busy doing good for people to fill out stupid forms. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that a sort of reluctance to get involved in the um, heavily sort of monitoring and evaluation trends that were gripping the development field. So that was sort of one hypothesis. 
I, th I think what was also interesting was that there really were quite different um, approaches in those early times um, that on the one hand, there was a sense, look, we really just need to know what different organizations are doing and what are the results and do they work? And then there was another current, which was started from the hypothesis that the religious approach was both distinctive, but also better. And the tension between those two, sort of an objective versus a, we're going to prove that this is a better approach. Um, I think that that complicated the early years. Um, since then, um, this I to jump ahead a bit, my own sense is that the evidence question has changed a lot, though a lot of people haven't caught up. I think a lot of people still think that if we could just get more studies out, that that, that would solve the problem, which I don't agree with. Um, I think, in fact, and we've done work, for example, with the USAID, Evidence Summit on Strategic Religious Engagement in October um, 2020, that there is an enormous amount of information available, even though it is quite fragmented, um, a bit spotty, heavily geared towards Africa, heavy on Christianity, uh, heavy on certain kinds of topics. Uh, but still, the the issue is not that there isn't evidence. Um, I, that really almost is a is a is a straw man at this point. Um, even though clearly having solid evidence is widely recognized as one of the key challenges for for working on development. And um, talking about evidence, a JLI, you know, has done. A an attempt to come up with a publication around evidence, and you were involved um, as well. Um, can you tell a bit, you know, about, uh, from your point of view, the importance of this document, what it was able to achieve, what it didn't achieve, and, you know, from your point of view, what you hope that maybe the next publication will show? Well, the um, state of the evidence report uh, which which is a JLI, a Joint Learning Initiative flagship, I think is to some extent responding to the nagging uh, concern that a part of the problem with the religious approaches and work is that they're not documented and they're not known. Uh, I think more than that, though, the religious world is enormously complex. In other words, I don't use the word religion anymore because mm. I, I think you have to say religious beliefs or religious communities or religious mm -hmm. approaches or something. Um, and so um, both the U.S. Aid Summit that I was very much part of and then the JLI um, evidence is more an effort to bring together and trace some of the major themes uh, and and some of the issues. In other words, what what are the the basic questions uh, that are involved? Uh, and you know, what have we learned? Um, and what are we learning? What are the gaps in knowledge uh, where there needs to be a much uh, much more in depth approach? Um, I know that from the World Faiths Development Dialogue, um, we have been convinced for a long time. Um, and again, we have this sort of 25 year history that until you come to the country level and start asking robust questions about what kinds of religious communities are there and what do they think about development, do they differ on basic strategies, um, that it all is rather abstract. So I think the JLI um, report, which came out um, about a year and a half ago, um, is a very um, useful. Um, and much needed effort to to pull things together and then to go in somewhat greater depth into a few of the key sectors. So, for example, health and gender um, are issues that come up all the time. And so those are those have importance. Yeah, so those are maybe some areas where you know the report maybe is but i i always think in terms of where does it 
glow, you know, what is what went well and, and where can we still grow further? Um, if I ask you in terms of grow, where's, you know, the next report, because I know, you know, we are talking about the next iteration of this report. Where do you think uh, there needs to be further improvement in terms of the publication? Well, the, in a way, the positive, I mean, the, the um, no brainer mm -hmm. issue uh, is uh, climate change, mm -hmm. which has many different aspects. So I think climate change is, is um, an area that has many different aspects um, that I think do take us well beyond the advocacy, which is which one of them. The question that's always difficult in this is that mm -hmm. what we're looking for is is what is distinctive about different religious approaches, uh, and so that I think is is um is a question in climate. In other words, having religious organizations advocating for action is one thing. Another is the kind of work they do that demonstrates um, paths, but also that highlights where there are obstacles. Um, a second area that's very obvious, uh, sadly, today um, is conflict resolution. And there is a lot of interest in religious peace building um, mm. that I think there'll be a growing interest in that. So many of the conflicts today, as many people would say, they're not religious, but they do have religious elements. And there are very strong and ancient traditions of um, of uh, religious roles in in conflict resolution and peace building. So I think that among other issues, one that I have a particular interest myself mm -hmm. is looking at the religious dimensions of the many truth and reconciliation efforts that have mm -hmm. taken place that are trying to build more permanent um solutions uh look look at the at the truth but also at the reconciliation uh they take many different forms but i think that the religious roles are not as well documented as other aspects of the truth and reconciliation and then finally i i have to say that the issue of issues around family mm -hmm. and gender and sexuality are so prominent and such a divisive element within religious communities, but mm -hmm. also between religious communities and their secular counterparts, uh, which take, of course, many different forms, that I, I think there's no getting away from being open and willing to deal with um, with those issues. No, th yeah, thanks for that, uh, Catherine. I mean, that's yeah, in, in, definitely um, interesting. Hey, you, you know, you you have been really involved, you know, since the beginning, um, and I mean, you alluded to that in, in the conversations that you had when the JLI started to be there. I think around twenty twelve or so, twenty thirteen. Um, if I ask you to come up with an anecdote that uh, best describes your experience with JLI, what what anecdote would you tell? Oh, I, I have to say that it's the beauty, but also the challenge mm. of JLI is this idea of joint learning, mm -hmm. uh, which in a, as an anecdote translated into endless phone calls and long conversations with people who came at an issue from very different perspectives. And the initial efforts of JLI focused a lot on the um, on um, doing what were called scoping studies and hubs uh, that were trying to bring together people working on, for example, refugee issues or mm -hmm. trafficking. So those are a lot of my early memories um, was of trying to un trying to trace a path that would really be about learning and creativity, but that also, and that would be, um, that would be inclusive, all these words that we use these days, but trying to figure out good ways um, to, to make that practical um, using some of the new technologies. 
I think the most prominent issue um, that JLI was involved in, um, which I was more peripherally involved in for a variety of reasons, uh, was around the Istanbul summit, the humanitarian summit, um, where JLI did really an enormous amount of, of background work on the religious roles uh, that in different um, humanitarian refugee issues. It's quite striking that those issues are still very prominent today. They're very much at the center of our attention. But it was it was a case where where that work with all sorts of problems, a lot of people who were very hesitant to see that happen um, in Istanbul. Um, JLI, I guess, persisted enough uh, that there was, in fact, um, a, quite a sharp focus uh, within the JLI community on that refugee issue. Yeah, well, yeah, no, and, and, and you're right. I mean, that's definitely still an issue and, and related with climate change as well, then, mm -hmm. not only because of the, the you know, wars and, and, and name it. Um, and another another a topic that is really, you know, um, keeping uh, the humanitarian and development organizations busy, well, actually the, the whole world, is the, is the issue of localization and decolonization. Um, where do you see the debates going on this topic um, in terms of religious beliefs and development in the next five to ten years? I'm not sure, to be honest, where there's a distinctive religious element in this hmm. discussion. I mean, it's it, it, it's one of these cases where you have to go beyond some of the surface um aspects of a of a challenge and into some of the deeper ones so with the localization um what the that it part of development clearly is and it's become increasingly obvious over the years that just sort of consulting or informing people about what they should do has to give way to what we now call empowerment and, and active engagement. But it also, the whole point of development, of course, is bringing um, experience elsewhere and knowledge. So how do you do that in ways that are meaningful? So to me, that is the primary challenge of, of localization is, is getting out of the very bad habits of um, headquarters assuming they know it all and that they can actually come in and tell people what to do and keep the money and have big vehicles and you know fly around the world at will um without really respecting and engaging uh the people who are most directly affected um i think where it gets problematic is when there is um when people lose sight of the two way two-way involvement, which otherwise, what's the point of development? I mean, it's, um, I think the other thing that I'm missing is that we're dealing in development with a wide um, spectrum of, of approaches, which can be very different from the policy. In other words, how does a country, through its leadership, um, which of course is very different, um, how does it set the course and how does it set the policies that even a tiny stroke of the pen can affect the lives of millions of people? And how does that link to the sort of ideal of community projects that engage people? Because the two have to be have to be seen in relation to one another, which is which is very difficult. So that I think the localization debate goes into a lot of blind alleys um, and turns much too much on money and far too little on ideas uh, and the complexities of institutional structures. Um, the decolonization, I don't know, I, I spend in the early part of my career working with a lot of ex-colonials. I mean, I know the, the 
the colonial world and mentality. And of course, there were some really remarkable visionaries in that process. Um, so again, I think that there's there's an unfortunate tendency to oversimplify uh, what what the challenge is, what the problem is. And um, I think that m more and more, there is an appreciation of what what one sociologist called multiple modernities, that there are a lot of different paths, that there's not a, a single a single solution. Um, and they're certainly not the ones that the colonial powers, uh, contemporary or past, um, necessarily put forward. Uh, so, but beyond that, I think we have to look at each situation. Hmm. Um, and and yes, yeah, so you know, there's a lot uh, of importance around context right i mean what i if, if you talk about joint learning mutual learning it depends on the context how that goes mm -hmm. um i have a question about the development part that you alluded to um i, I think and, and policy you mentioned and the differences between what's happening you know at the policy level at the local level maybe the ultimate uh, example of that is the 17 sustainable development goals that you know we have agreed upon as, as a world um we are at how many years ago seven years ago and we are um only at, at on average at 15 percent of reaching those goals um yeah is there a how do you see um the role of of uh, jli within this in uh you know facilitating translating or helping to this world to reach those goals well, I, th I think if you look back to the Millennium Declaration in the year mm. 2000 and the original Millennium Development Goals, now the Sustainable Development Goals, they're as close as, as we have to a sort of agreed global architecture um, that really does try to focus on translating human rights principles of of social justice into the tangible targets that that are inspired in many ways by business, that unless you have targets um, that are quantified, unless you have dates, um, deadlines, unless you have people who are accountable, that things don't happen. I mean, that's a sort of underlying philosophy to it all. Hmm. I think the challenge uh, for JLI and and of course for WFDD is taking things that can be very abstract uh, um, at a very global level and then trying to translate them both into terms that people can understand and relate to uh, and and um, into what that implies in terms of action. So these sort of the SDGs themselves are not likely to mean very much to somebody in Malawi uh, or in Mindanao or uh, or in um, Guatemala. Um, but if if you take the context which you were highlighting mm -hmm. um, and look at, for example, um, an issue like child marriage or an issue like maternal mortality or infant mortality, um, you can use both the inspiration of what's happened in other places, the fact that I think one of the most exciting things about development is that we know that it can be done. You can make enormous strides and then translate that into something that is meaningful at a local level. Uh, so so I think that it is it is a guide to us all. Um, I think where it gets complicated is when you get to the targets and you get to the you know quantitative targets and um uh, how many toilets do you need to build and um you know how do you how do you encourage people to use them you really cannot <laughs> when you're when you're working with people be very much um inspired by the sdgs themselves i've been struck recently that i've been in a couple of different places um i was in sri lanka um, where SDGs are all over the place, the posters of SDGs, people talk a language of SDGs, went to Ghana to the religious communities, and I, people just drew a blank when you mentioned them. It was mm. 
And I've heard that in Indonesia where people say that, you know, okay, people come in from outside with SDGs on the brain and people just draw complete blank as to what you're talking about. So I think our challenge is to make it relevant by, first of all, this idea of that there's certain standards that we're really working towards that are human rights standards the, that we believe deeply in, but also that you, you have to weigh how that applies in any given situation and, and translate what that means uh, into terms that make sense to the people you're working with. I I, um, I always have have some lighter questions as well, uh, uh, Catherine. Um, I mean, just for the for the heck of it, um, yeah, make this a little <laughs> bit less uh, less. Uh, no, but I, I ponderous. It, it, and a lot of folks, I always when I ask this, they oh, this is the most difficult question you're asking, Maurice. So my question to you is, I I love music. So if I ask you to come up with a piece of music or a song that, according to you, uh, embodies best what JLI is about. What song or piece of music would it be, and why? Yeah, I have to say I have no clue. No, um, I don't. Let me. Uh, I can't even think. So take your time. I think something different about you know, do it my way. I, I think that's <laughs> not not the approach. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the opposite of <laughs> I did it my way. Can you think of something that has diversity in it? Um, the joy of difference? I don't know. Maybe. Good. No, I, I, I think that particular statement says, says a lot in terms of, of uh, the opposite of I did it my way in diversity. Um, so it's interesting. I, I don't know about any of the songs as well now at this moment, but I'm sure there are uh, songs who try to cover that. So um, let us think. Maybe at the end of the conversation, you will you will come up with something. Um, if I ask you, um, you know, to name a colleague, a partner or a supporter, uh, you know, um, that works with JLI, who best embodies what JLI is about, which name pops up in your head? Oh, whose name? Sorry. Yeah. Hmm, you do ask these tough questions, don't you? <laughs> I mean, it. I think one of the challenges for all of us working in this area is that we are navigating between the prophetic voice, um, the hope that by working with religious actors and communities whose, whose role in the world is in a sense to give us both hope but also visions of what the world can be. Um, I think that that um, you're looking, we're looking for that prophetic voice. And you do find, you know, the prophetic voices, some are religious, some are not. I don't know, Jonathan Sachs, um, um, so um, Desmond Tutu, um, so, you know, some of these, uh, these people who, who I think we, we really can call modern prophets. I think Andrea Riccardi, um, um, Wangari Mathai, and, and people who may or may not have a particularly religious um, calling, but do have that prophetic sense. But we also are dealing with people who are very practical, uh, who understand how people live. I mean, I do, I guess I do, when I'm thinking of it, and when you know, trying to make the case uh, that we should take these religious worlds uh, more seriously. Uh, do look at at some people of great courage uh, who have great determination. Uh, you know, uh, 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 I think of Gideon Biamugisha, um, who has been such a, a, a courageous spokesperson leader uh, on HIV AIDS, and there are a number of others uh, around that. Um, Paul Farmer, um, the people who've been able to 
translate some of the human rights principles into practice, into um, some of the women um, who uh, have really gone beyond the sort of binary discussions uh, that come under the, that raise, that rouse um, some doubts uh, among people about um, the modern face of um, of of feminism, the people who who go beyond and give us insights into the struggles that people face uh, and the ways that they come to terms with them. Yeah, you you named a lot of a lot of names. I would really encourage the listeners to check out some of these names and and. Many of them have written books as well, were definitely worthwhile uh, reading um, or you know getting acquainted with their story. Thanks for sharing that, uh, Catherine. Um, you know, you mentioned climate change. You know, you mentioned a lot of problems that this world is is uh, is facing. Um, and what I've and and then you also mentioned prophetic voice, and I'm trying to kind of. Um, break that you know what 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 are we getting at here and um i have heard lately catherine in terms of you know people saying one of the reasons um that we are facing these problems you know we are in the middle of a poly crisis and maybe beyond that even it has to do is that we are realizing that we have to change you know certain systems and processes but we are not paying proper attention to the ability, skills, and knowledge that you need as individuals and as community to work on these changes. Um, yeah, what what is your reaction when you hear that? I think um, there it's a very difficult conversation, and mm -hmm. I see it very much in the context of a topic that I'm working on, which is bringing the best of the religious inspiration into the G20 process, that going from the place where a Pope Francis sits or a patriarch or um, the Sheikh of Al-Azhar or, or even a Sulak Sivaraksa in, in Thailand, um, you know, the people who are trying to look at the whole world um, how do you link that to what people are struggling with in their in their daily lives of trying to figure out when to plant a crop and when to harvest it and what to do about a flood um, or a drought? So you know, it's it's a very long journey from that very very global vision to the place where people live their daily lives. And I think we need to recognize some of the different steps. Um, but one of the one of the challenges now that we're seeing in so many ways is that people do want to have a voice in the big issues. Like, you know, the UN is going to have the summit for the for the future and the um uh, the Catholic Church has the synod on synodality, which is trying to sort of hear the voices uh, of the marginal. But, you know, I really have to confess that sort of hearing people say, and I was even reading this today in the statement coming out of the COP28 and the Faith Pavilion that we have to change the economic system. Um, I'm not sure how meaningful that is because it isn't part of a conversation about that it isn't part of an informed and thoughtful um, engagement, which I think is desperately needed. Now, clearly, you know, some of the thinkers within the, the global institutions, and there I would put the Vatican and Pope Francis, um, some of the Orthodox, um, but also the, I think it's the responsibility of the big interreligious organizations like Religions for Peace. And it is, I think, the responsibility of a JLI and the responsibility of a world faiths development to dialogue to be trying to to help people to navigate these these huge issues at the same time that you're dealing with the local and 
Mm. It's very easy to go off track and to go into the deep weeds, into the mud, um, which I think is not necessarily very helpful. So I think that it's hard and you do find yourself dealing with in one hour sort of what should be the the role of the market and Mm -hmm. is greed the real problem to how do we um, deal with, um, you know, issues that women are facing in a cooperative in in a small country. So, you know, we do have, and, and I call this sometimes the translators, you know, we're we're working between these worlds. But at the moment, I think one of the problems with polarization and part of the problem with failure to make progress is that we're not navigating well between these different perspectives and, and worlds. And you can see it fairly easily in some policy discussions uh, and issues of uh, sort of what is policy. Uh, but I think, and and really linking the very practical with the with the very abstract. So what, you know, what can our organizations do? You know, your organization, you're also part of JLI. What should we be doing to help this facilitate or translate uh, you know, in, within these type of situations? Well, I think I think it's many different things. One mm-hmm. is that a major part of our responsibility and, and capacity is to listen and to hear. Mm-hmm. In other words, to to take the temperature to get a better sense of what what's driving people, what's what's making them angry. I think we have a huge professional responsibility. And one of the things I think is that before we open our mouths, we need to know what we're talking about. Um, and we have a responsibility to what some people are calling truth, um, to fairness, to putting things into context. Um, and, you know, I, I had a very interesting conversation years ago hmm. um, with Archbishop Ndungani, who replaced Desmond Tutu as the Archbishop, the Anglican Archbishop of Cape Town. And it was at a time when there was a lot of difficulty around Zimbabwe. Uh, and a lot of tensions that involved churches, but that involved politics, that involved very practical issues. But I was in a car with him, and I, I asked him, how are you dealing with the Zimbabwe situation? And he said in great frustration, he said, you can't be an advocate and a mediator at the same time. And I think we do find ourselves in those positions that we're trying in this polarized world with so much anger and so many different approaches, we find ourselves um, both uh, trying to to have the prophetic vision and to say, this is the way the world needs to go, um, or supporting the people who have that vision, but at the same time saying, as we say time and time again, it's complicated. You know, there are different ways of looking at this. And to me, that is what ethics is about. That's what the mm-hmm. ethics of development turn around much less what's good and bad and what's right and wrong than it is on trying to bring the best of some of the different perspectives and to be able to hear and to reconcile and to bring a real some knowledge and some ideas to it. I, I have to I have to say I really um, liked what you said there. I, I I often it's you know my own translation of what I heard you say, and you tell me if I'm wrong. Is you know it's it's so easy, um, and that's what's happening a lot to criticize, um, you know others. Um, but you know at the end of the day, uh, you know maybe together we should focus more on you know how are we going to solve this. Yeah. Um, than anything else so um I, if, if I, you know i, I could i could uh, continue to listen to you you know for another hour but uh i, I have two two more questions for you um one is um and this is more for, you know for myself than anything else i have to admit but if you are asked to to come up with an elevated speech about jli or about your own work because you know the two organizations have you know, have a lot of uh, things in common right what is your uh, elevator speech? So that's the first question. And then the last question is, 
if you can dream, if you are allowed to dream, you know, with in terms of, you know, we have all the resources available. How do you see the future of this organization? There really are two narratives mm -hmm. that are follow a little bit from what I was talking about before. One is that development has failed. The SDGs are only 15%, um, that there's no clear path ahead. But I think there's a very different vision that inspires us that we have never in human history seen the kind of progress in the quality of people's lives, whether it's measured in children who don't die, um, in women's education, in the whole world of education, uh, in the dramatic increases in health that gives people a chance in the understandings of of freedom of expression, um, even the internet and even you know AI, uh, all of these, if we see them as as something extraordinary, almost miraculous, it was described once as modern miracles. Um, I think that we are trying to navigate between the two, uh, dealing with the disappointments and the hard spots. In other words, the places that are not seeing the kind of progress uh, that many parts of the world are seeing and working with people to overcome the challenges and come up with the ideas that are needed to, to do uh, and to reach what I think is the answer to your second question, which is that we, and this has been said many times by Harry Truman, by Franklin Roosevelt, by Mandela, by many others, that we really live in a world where things that are are possible that were never dreamed of even 150 years ago. And we are in a position where we have a small chance, I mean, a small part. It's a big chance, but a small part uh, to contribute to moving, moving along, removing obstacles, opening paths, and, and encouraging the kind of hope. Uh, that we would like, that that must drive um, the move in the right direction. Any question that I should have asked you that I didn't? <laughs> oh, there are lots of other things. As you say, we could talk for hours, <laughs> but I think your questions are very probing uh, and challenging. I still have no music for you. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Maybe we should ask the listeners who sent us, you know, a suggestion, right? Maybe you make it interactive. So if you if you are listening and you come up with a piece of music, opposite of I did it my way, that really, you know, put emphasis on, you know, diversity and different perspectives, the importance of that, then let us know. Both Catherine and I would love to listen to that piece of music. Um, okay, my really last question is, what, what type of ancestor would you like to be, Catherine? You mean how would my, like my great-grandchildren? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, th I I guess I would like them to inherit um, as a family tradition and as a, a cultural tradition, this idea of of um, of service, of um, contributing, and the the respect for complexity, so that life is always a puzzle. Uh, that you're learning constantly. I guess that's a good thing about the joint learning initiative that mm -hmm. it it has as as a core idea that we're learning constantly and need to to keep keep doing it. Great. Thank you so much for your time and, and willingness to talk with me and share your you know your knowledge um, and and for everything you do as well. And I would really um, encourage the listeners to check out you know the books that you've written, the lectures you have given. There's so much out there. So check it out. I will make sure there are some links in the in the podcast notes as well. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Maurice. As we wrap up today's insightful conversation, I hope 
it has sparked your curiosity and interest in the vital work of the Joint Learning Initiative on Faith and Local Communities, JLI. If today's episode has resonated with you, whether it's the desire to collaborate, contribute or even offer financial support to further JLI's impactful mission, we'd love to hear more from you. The JLI's journey is one of collaboration, learning and making a tangible difference in communities through the unique intersection of faith and development. Your involvement could be a significant part of this transformative process. Whether you're looking to offer your expertise, resources, or are seeking to understand more about how you can contribute, your initiative is invaluable. Please feel free to reach out to us. Send an email to maurice at jliflc.com or contact us through our platform. We welcome your thoughts, questions, and proposals for collaboration. I'll personally ensure that your interest is directed to the right people at JLI, helping you connect with a network of individuals and organizations dedicated to creating a better world through faith-informed development. Thank you for joining us on Walk, Talk, Listen, where each conversation brings us closer to understanding and action. Your engagement doesn't just end with listening, it begins here. Let's continue to be part of this remarkable journey together. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Walk, Talk, Listen. Please check us out on 100mile.org or follow us on Facebook or Instagram.